Hello, I'm Mike Takak, and I'm here today to support the mission of this conference to connect the dots. My presentation attempts to connect the physical to the social domain. How beneficial would such a connection be in helping to advance global civility? The simplicity of a physical reference may aid education within a scientific venue. Such a connection may help philosophical reformation on a global scale. That is a simple physical relationship for all to understand. Lacking a physical reference invites philosophical inconsistency. For example, in 1776, Thomas Jefferson celebrated philosophy of unalienable rights. In 1908, Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States, claimed those unalienable rights were nonsense. In 1948, the UN devised their own version of human rights listed in 30 articles, with no reference to Jefferson's rights. And today, we are going back to the future with the Commission on Unalienable Rights under the stewardship of Mike Pompeo. I have no affiliation with this commission. This presentation explores the science of rights and its potential benefits to society, markets, and the rule of law. All organic life must have freedom, liberty within its domain in the pursuit of survival. Otherwise, there is no life. Survival is a prerequisite for human happiness. The axiomatic logic of these bioprimitives maintains a self-evident truth represented in equations one and two where one's philosophy of happiness is subjective. Equations one and two represents the ends of a spectrum driven by liberty and energy ranging from negative to positive feedback. This feedback is presented here in the following block diagram showing freedom and pursuit are dependent on a relationship by the simple fact that some pursuits are easier than others, where no two relationships are equal. Here we have a simple experiment. Your life has a relationship with your respiratory system. Take its freedom away by holding your breath until you feel negative feedback. Restoring your freedom maintains a noticeable positive feedback too often taken for granted. One should also notice the air we breathe is not free, for it takes bioenergy in the pursuit of your next breath and that energy comes from food. Here we have the experiment's relationship to thermodynamics. The first law relative to the conservation of energy, where something cannot be gained for nothing or from nothing. The second law, from the high stress of hunger to the low stress of consumption, and the constructor law in the evolution of dendritic air passages. Here we have the constructor law with its dendritic signature. With the axiom of unalienable rights in the constructor law, we could now connect those dots from the physical to the social domain. Such connection could bring about a paradigm shift throughout the social sciences. It is common knowledge that no man-made law or philosophy can change a physical law of nature. Having the awareness of unalienable rights and a constructor law are similar or the same, how beneficial could this be in expanding global civility? Relative to flow, the constructor law transcends domain. We all have our own philosophy and it too flows through time as it evolves or reforms as a function of enlightenment. Here's an example of our unalienable rights to the constructor law relative to the evolution of philosophy. That is, for the flow of a philosophical reformation to persist in time, to live, life, it must evolve freely, liberty, such that it provides greater access, the pursuit of, to its pedagogic currents of nature via discovery, happiness. Discovery promotes change in philosophy, culture, markets, technology, the sciences, etc., resulting in dendritic patterns covering the Earth's surface while changing the dendritic neuron configuration in the evolution of our consciousness. 
in going forward, I'm going to use the shorthand flow current pair notation for the constructor law. Applying this notation to the above philosophical example reads as follows. Philosophical reformation flows towards the pedagogic currents of nature. A list of constructal flow current pairs complemented with some philosophy. Relative to the constructal law's discovery, a new reality emerges as we look back at those established philosophies, in particular, the ones that seem to contradict each other. Today, scholars may see the world of their predecessors differently, as in the case of Herbert Spencer's popular phrase, survival of the fittest. One would wonder if social Darwinism embraced the adage, survival of the happiest, would history be different? Relative to a nation state, I will focus on the following. Reason and ethics is the foundation of a civil society. The world became a local neighborhood at the individual level over the last number of decades thanks to technology. Civility is a function of the golden rule, which is an outgrowth of the constructal law via life's unalienable rights. Thermodynamics is taught in a science class, so why not teach ethics in a science class? And perhaps in units of generational time, our young global neighborhood may embrace civility similar to the light of South Korea rather than the darkness in the North. Notice the light variance in branching out from the urban centers to the suburban and rural regions of South Korea depicting the constructive law signature. The question, can we have ethics without free will? I'll add the constructor law to this classic debate of free will over determinism. Starting with a simple Ohm's law example, it is common knowledge electron flow takes the path of least resistance, shown here where R1 is less than R2. The constructor law includes to evolve freely, and given enough time in the right environment, those electrons will form a dendritic path bypassing the resistor seeking additional free electron flow. It's like the universe is wired to seek freedom. And on that note, we too are wired with a willful desire to seek freedom as opposed to free will within a physical universe of which we are not free from. Relative to our ancestors a few centuries ago, we expanded our freedom of choice to go to the moon, fly above the clouds, etc. No one human could achieve such accomplishments without a civil society. Hence, freedom is dependent on ethics. In the shadow of Leonardo da Vinci's claim, a market does sell us all good things at an ethical price of labor. Many scholars throughout the ages wrote passionately about markets, economics, and wealth generation, as in the case of Adam Smith's well-known phrase, the invisible hand. Smith's usage of the phrase implies a mystery. He left no elaboration, but we do know evolution was not a mainstream concept in his time. In today's language, the constructor law is a good fit reducing the mystery, at least the mystery behind those dendritic flows within a market, an empirical signature that warrants certainty where Smith's invisible hand is the hand of the constructor law via life's unalienable rights. According to Hayek, money is an instrument of freedom. The pursuit of wealth is feedback for additional freedom and facilitating pursuit. Wealth is a type of energy storage where its value is dependent on consensus. Affordable freedom is a function of one's wealth within a civil society. This presentation covers three types of laws, the physical laws of nature, natural law, and man-made law. Considering our unalienable rights are the link between the physical and social domains, we may represent a diagram of the knowledge tree of law with emphasis on inheritance. Within this inheritance, the omnipotent physical laws of nature regulate the universe. Nurturing in reason and ethics, natural law, embraces one's self-regulation in the evolution of a civil society. Self-regulation is fallible, 
hence some form of governance, man-made law, helps to preserve civility. Governance is also fallible and is regulated by the unalienable rights of a civil society. Hence, the invisible hand, the construct the law at work, lifting the tide of the standard of living for all. Since life is dependent on the physical laws of nature and having inheritance throughout the tree of law, why not calibrate man-made law relative to the nine properties of the laws of nature? The nine properties are here in bold, followed by a translation to help guide the development of man-made law. Thomas Jefferson is in. Woodrow Wilson is out. Let's incorporate the constructal paradigm in the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are similarities in Article 3 relative to unalienable rights, where security of person replaced pursuit of happiness. The introduction of the constructal law in Article 3 brings life to the UDHR towards the currents of civil effectiveness in the evolution of global civility. The German poet Holderlein once said, what has always made the state a hell on earth has been precisely that man has tried to make it his heaven. May I coin the term constructalism, the axiom of unalienable rights, and ethical application of the constructal law. Hypothetically, if Holderlein was here today, he may publish the following. What has always made the state a joy on earth has been precisely that man has liberty in the moral pursuit of his own heaven. Recapping some highlights, not bad for a presentation within 15 minutes. The main theme is simplicity, to help make our world a better place to live. No new laws or rights were covered. What was new is connecting the dots between them. Thank you for your interest. Thank you okay. very much. I'm back live here if there's any questions. So we did questions? I can ask one question. Uh, okay, I, go I, ahead. I saw a down vote for Theodore, uh, President Wilson, is that correct? And he believed in evolution. So how does that fit in with the down vote? Evolution? Uh, well, uh, he believed that this government is... should be based on Darwinian principles. Uh, Darwinian principles is just a principle of natural selection. Um, what I'm showing here is the connection, basically, of a philosophy by Thomas Jefferson is no longer a philosophy, but actually a physical law of nature because it has symmetry to the constructor law. That's the primary point of this uh, presentation. And since Jefferson's philosophy of unalienable rights is no longer a philosophy, then it's part of the physical laws of nature. And this is the um, link between social systems and the physical laws of nature. In, in in my uh, opinion. Okay, thank you. Do we have more questions to ask? And yes, I do have a question. I'm Veronica okay. Poor. Okay. And I have a question about slide eight. Uh, would you mind, is it possible to go back? Because actually it was too fast for me, so I couldn't see all of, all of it first. Sure, slide eight. Okay. Thank you. And then there, so what I could See, first of all, that there was a lot of est, est there. And I was wondering whether, um, whether what about the Sufis? So that uh, it's uh, like uh, Herbert Simon's uh, sufficient uh, approach and not the best, the happiest. What do you think about that? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, so... Um, if you see, for example, in natural selection, there is survival of fittest. In ethics, survival of happiest. And often the wording of, uh, of the question 
or or the approach what i feel is is the most so the the best will win but there is also the approach that it should be just enough so we shouldn't look for the best but what is good enough and i was wondering whether uh, whether that would also make sense because yes well it all depends on whatever the objective is and um your accomplishments is based on whether it's positive or negative. If you fail the particular objective, you're going to have a negative uh, emotional feedback. And therefore, either you try again until you succeed and there's some positive experience. That positive experience is subjective. It could be happiness, it could be joy, uh, it, it could be anything that one considers to be positive as far as goodness as opposed to a failure. I don't know if I answer the, uh, the part here. Your focus is on the definition of happiness. Is, is that what the uh, issue is here? No, actually, my, my focus is more about uh, not optimizing, but just uh, looking for a better option. Well, uh, that's part uh, of evolution is find the better option. The better, but not the best, and that's the survival of the fittest sort of means the best, whereas survival of the fitter would mean the better one. So that, but I think we agree, we completely agree. So I see that from your explanation. That yeah, the, the survival of the fittest is more or less on on a um, instinct level. When you get into higher forms of um, civility, it's more or less happiness and not the fittest, more or less. Because you can have unfit humans to be very happy in a civil society.